I can't believe how many agents have never even heard of a real estate syndication. I mean, I was at an event for my brokerage, our annual meeting, and I was speaking with the former president of the Florida Association of Realtors. He'd been the association realtor for five years of the whole state of Florida. He'd never heard of it. Yeah. Like, wow. If you're a real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show is for you. Learn secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field who will guide you on your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so you can take your commissions and turn them into cash flow. Here's your host, Randall. Let's dive in. Hey, hey, welcome back. It's good to have you today. I have an awesome guest on. Today, we're talking real estate syndication. We are talking about apartments. Victoria McGuire is my guest, and she is the owner of Hartsill Capital Partners. We talk about her history. She's been a real estate agent for a long time. She started in 2005. I believe that was the time frame she gave me. And we talk about how they became uh, forced landlords, kind of what that looked like for her, started her investing career in 2008-ish, and then how she's transitioned into apartments with her husband and they raise capital for and syndicate deals, co-GP on deals. So it's a really interesting conversation. I dive deep. I try to get her to give me some tactics on what she's doing in order to raise capital. So if you're looking to start a syndication business, we cover a lot of that stuff in this in this conversation. Some of the tools that you can use, some of the platforms that you can go to, some things that she's using and her husband are using. So really good conversation. She's a marathoner. So she was literally calling me from, I think, hotel and she's going to run a marathon tomorrow. So that was really awesome. And she's telling me how she's going to run six back to back in November. So like six, one a day, fly to another city, run another one, run, run, fly to another city, run another one. So avid runner, very awesome. So anyways, good catching up with her. I hope you get a lot out of the show. It was a great conversation for me. If you're getting some value out of the show, please go on rate and review. It helps us a ton. So let's jump in. So right. are you buying property there or what are you doing in Kansas? You said you're in Kansas City? No, I'm in Kansas City. I'm, I'm actually going to meet with some of our partners here that we team up with, but I'm also going to run a marathon oh, on nice. Saturday. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I love running marathons. I'm on a quest to run one in each of the 50 states. So this Very is cool. checking off uh, Kansas. And so I'm, you know, putting in some work too, so that I can kind of kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, for sure. I was looking at the rock and roll San Antonio is in December. Nice. And so I was looking at signing up for that. My dad runs a, or he doesn't run. He, he, um, cause I like trail running. And so he does the ham radio operation to like, as a marshal for a lot of these off road, like in big Bend oh, and places cool. where you, you don't have cell reception. And so he does want a big Bend. I'm going to sign up for, I think I do a 50 K there. But yeah, yeah. I like the idea of going to every state. Are you doing the ones that are like a rock and roll or like a really well known, like the those types of, of deals, or is it just like any run that gets you a it's marathon? A mix, right? Like I like to do some of the bigger runs, but then also I don't know if you've heard of this website that's called Mainly Marathons. No. So it's kind of for people that are trying to do the 50 states. Okay. And what they do is they set up like a series back to back to back where you can run like six marathons in six days in six different states. So it's a fast way to knock out a bunch yeah. of them. If you're trying to catch up, like, like I fell behind a little bit in my goals last year because my husband ended up in the hospital and, you know, some of the ones that I was going to, I wasn't able to. And so I'm playing catch up this year. So I'm going to try to do that. But those are all more like the races you're describing, like a trail run where, you know, you're just doing some loops and, yeah you're completing the marathon, checking the state, and then you're going to the next state and doing it all over yeah. again. But I do like to do the bigger ones too. They're definitely a lot more fun. Yeah. The first 50 K trail run I did, it was, it was three loops around a park here in San Antonio. Oh and yeah. I was like, I, uh, I, I like seeing new things. So yeah. I want to go By the like third loop. One, you're like, Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> yeah. By the third loop, I tweaked my knee and I was walking and I was like, Oh, okay. This is not. Yeah. But, <laughs> so we can talk on the investing side of the business, like what you, you you guys are doing, what you have done. I know you built a portfolio based on what I've read on your bio. And then you guys have transitioned into capital raising. Are you, so you are syndicating as far as I understand, correct? Yeah. So my husband's more on the capital race side. So we're a husband and wife team. Yep. That's kind of his superpower is what yeah. we call it in our mastermind group that we're a part of. We're part of Rod Cleef's Warriors. Yeah. Um, 
don't know if you've heard of them. I literally just saw a quick short on him. I, I was oh. at a few events and he's talked at a bunch of events, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. He's down in Sarasota. We live in Tampa, like okay. well, the beach is part of Tampa. So he's just South of us. We joined his mastermind about two years ago and just kind of jumped in full speed ahead. And long story short, my husband's kind of superpower is the capital raise. And I'm more like on the underwriting side, okay. but I am trying to get better about helping my husband with the capital raise as well, so that we can get more of the, you know, GP percentages on the deals that we're raising capital for. So I'm kind of doing similar to what you're doing. I'm trying to help agents get into this because I can't believe how many agents have never even heard of a real estate syndication. I mean, I was at an event for my brokerage, our annual meeting, and I was speaking with the former president of the Florida Association of Realtors. He'd been the Association of Realtor for five years of the whole state of Florida. He'd never heard of it. Yeah. Like, wow, you know, the, uh, really getting the word out and the education of this is another way that you can invest your money and kind of yeah. diversify your portfolio. That's kind of a passion of mine now. And so I'm really focused on educating realtors as well. So when I saw your podcast, I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> um, and I listened to some of, of the episodes and they really uh, resonated with me. Nice. Yeah. I mean, it is kind of shocking because you can get siloed pretty easily on the residential side of things and not understand that there is this whole other world. So yeah, that's great. So tell me, I guess then you, husband, wife team, but you have been a realtor since what? 2005. 2005? Yeah. Okay. So you've seen some ups, downs, you've seen all, all kinds of different things. So when did you start investing? Like, did were you buying property back then? No, we didn't start investing really until uh, it kind of happened by accident in 2008. Okay. Um, my husband got orders. Uh, he was Navy. We were stationed in Jacksonville. He got orders to Tampa. Everybody knows what happened to the market in 2008. Like we were completely upside down in our house and we were kind of stuck with either short sell it, which was not an option for us with him yeah. being military. That's just, we're not going to do that or rent it out. So we became an accidental landlord that way. And it was kind of a nightmare, but long story short, we, we kept the property long enough to where in the end, at least financially, it still worked out. Although we had, you know, tenants that left in the middle of the night, we had, you know, someone in the, had run their car into the air conditioner unit in the garage. I mean, we had so much damage to this house that we just wanted to cry because it was our primary residence before yeah. we made it a rental. So when you walk in and you just see all this damage, it was pretty emotional. And yeah. so in the end, we did make money on it. And that's when it, the light bulb kind of clicked. I was like, why aren't we doing this every time we move? Because we moved a lot back yeah. then when it was in the military, you know, every couple, two or three years. So that's kind of what we started doing then intentionally buying properties specifically to rent them, not for us to live in and then rent them. Cause I don't recommend that to anyone. Say that again. You don't recommend people living in them and renting them while they're in them. Is that yeah, well, and then renting it like we had to do oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. because you're emotionally tied to that house. And it's so hard to see your home, you know, that you took all this time to make it yours. And, you know, we had put up crown molding and, you know, it was our home for like, mm -hmm three years and then to see people destroy it, it is just a whole different ball game when you're buying it specifically for it to be a rental and you never lived in it. Yeah. You're not as emotionally tied to it. And it doesn't really matter if they tear it up kind of as much as it does if it was your own personal home, if that makes sense. For sure. No, no, it makes sense. You're buying the investment property based on the numbers, not on emotion. Yeah. Your house, exactly. it's your home. I definitely get that. Yeah. Uh, that's rough. The stories of like being a landlord. I mean, we could have a whole podcast on that just alone. There's I interviewed somebody the other day and they they have one and it was all geared towards landlords and like the struggles of being a landlord. Uh, and yeah. so she told me some stories. It was funny. So you got into it and this was 2008, 2009 ish. So how long did you have to keep it as a rental before you guys were able to sell it? I think we sold it in 2013 is when we yeah. finally ended up selling it and yeah. we made a pretty nice profit on it. And like I said, it gave us kind of that 
incentive to keep doing that. And we did, you know, we built a small portfolio, mostly of single family homes. And then we started seeing the same kind of thing though. Like, oh, we'd have to replace a roof or the AC would go out. We'd have to replace an air conditioner. Well, there was almost all the profit, you know, for the whole year yeah. um, because it's, you know, you're making pretty small margin. And that's when we started thinking like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And we started, you know, going bigger and we started buying duplexes and quadplexes. And still we, we were like, I think we can scale this. And that's what got us into multifamily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you got into multifamily at what point? This was, we were just talking about been recently, like two yeah. years ago. Okay. So yeah. I'm curious because, you know, similar background, I, I was flipping houses 2009 all the way up to 2020, whatever it was. And same thing, like I got to go bigger. There's got to be a better, better way to do this and buy bigger properties. So kind of got into it around that time, didn't buy anything, started learning. So I'm kind of curious, you are syndicating now. For those who are listening, if you don't know what a syndication is, go back. We have a ton of episodes on what syndications is, but you're raising capital to put into a larger deal. So you're pulling people's capital and then it's going into 150 unit property or 200 unit, whatever it is. Right. So how has that been in the last few years on the multifamily front where, because I know you guys are investing in Texas and Florida and South Carolina and somewhere else, right? Georgia. 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 That's right. Okay. So how has that been and how are the properties performing that you guys have, have gone into? It's been really great. You know, when we first started, it was slow, you know, there was the learning process and uh, what I do highly recommend for anybody that you know, wants to get started into actually syndicating deals or capital raising is to uh, find a mastermind group, find some education, something to, you know, help you get started because it is a lot in the beginning. There's so many things you have to learn. It's like a whole new world. I mean, there's acronyms that I never heard before, you know, learning how to underwrite so that you know what a deal looks like. All of that takes time. So that first kind of year that we were exploring this space that not a whole lot was happening. And it was a little bit frustrating, you know, the time that it took because we were just ready to go. But then I think the power of the first deal, right? Once you get that first deal, it's it's kind of like pushing a rock up a hill and then all of a sudden you're going down. Like people see, oh, well, this person knows what they're doing. Uh, this person was successful in doing that. I want to align with them. And then things just kind of start coming your way. Yeah. You want to talk details? Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So our yeah. first deal that we did, what, what was recommended to us, and I would recommend this to others as well, because it did uh, serve us well. We invested as LPs when we first started. That's a limited partner for people that aren't familiar with that. It's basically, you're just putting your money in. You're not really doing anything. The reason behind that and, and why I think that's so powerful is if you are going to be raising capital later, that does give you that knowledge of what those people are going through. So it's, it's a little intimidating when you're giving your money, let's say 50000 or or $100,000 to somebody, you know, and you have all this paperwork, the PPM docs are, you know, 100 pages or whatever, and you're having to go into this portal and sign up. And there's a lot of different steps. If you're not familiar with that, and you can't kind of empathize with the people that you're asking for money, I think it gives you more credibility when you're able to say, you know, I've been there, I've done that, and you can answer their questions better. And you know, all the feelings that they had, because you're having those same kind of feelings of anxiety that come with investing into something that you're not familiar with. So that's what we did first. And then actually the, the operator that we invested with as an LP, they invited us on their next deal. We had, you know, told them we're very confident that we can raise some capital. We felt like it would be uh, very doable for us to raise a million dollars for their deal. And they took a chance on us and gave us a shot. And we worked really, really hard. And we actually raised $2 million for that first deal. Awesome. So that's kind of when everything started falling into place. And then if people know you can raise money, they want you to be a part of their deal. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, all right. Agents that are listening, right. They want to go and, and do this. Maybe they want to raise capital because I always have to clarify there, there are multiple parts of the business. If you're trying to get into syndication, doesn't matter what asset class you're in. So if you're syndicating to, you know, buy a, a multifamily, a storage facility, a, a retail center, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. 
there's an operator who actually goes and they're going to be the one that's running it almost asset asset management they're the ones who may have sourced that deal so they're the lead sponsor in the deal and then there's co-gps that come in the deal and there's limited partners right so right. the the capital raise side of it is almost a business in, in its own right right you can have somebody who's just capital raising so are you guys looking to stay in that arena where you're like, we're really comfortable. We raised 2 million on our very first deal, which is awesome, by the way. Like if you're listening to this, that is not the norm. Like I, I wouldn't think, you know, so you, you guys really knocked it out of the park and I understand that. So congrats on that. Yeah, so is, that no, is that where I mean, you guys are trying to stay or? Well, we do like capital raising and, you know, we do see a future in continuing to do that, but we definitely want to operate our own deal because there is a little bit of frustration sometimes with being a co-GP. You can't only capital raise. Let me make that clear to everybody that's listening. If you're going to be in a syndication, it's illegal for you to only capital raise for a deal. You do have to have some other roles in the deal. So we help with you know the asset management. We do participate in due diligence. We put our own money into every deal that we raise for. So we are participating like in earnest money as well, which mm -hmm. also checks that box for the SEC of materially participating in the deal. But there's, you are limited, right? You only have so much input into decisions with the property and decisions with the management and things like that. So my husband and I, we are actively looking for our own deal, which has been frustrating because it takes a lot of time. I'm an underwriter. That's my role. And I probably underwrite, you know, gosh, I would say probably 20, 25 deals a month. And you know, it can take two or three months before we find one that is good enough for us to submit a letter of intent on. And then we submit the letter of intent and it's pretty competitive out there. So we don't always win, right? So, so far we haven't been successful, but we keep trying. And that is our end goal is to have maybe one of our own deals each year and then capital raise for a couple, two or three others a year. And I think that would be kind of our ideal situation. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot I want to talk about on just deal volume that you guys have done, but you mentioned something a second ago that it's kind of frustrating and not being the lead, right? I get that. Like I'm the same way. I'm like, I need, I need control. I need to be able to do this, 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 and this, if this isn't happening. So deals that I'm on that I'm not the lead on, it is a, um, you know, when you have those conversations, the asset management calls, or if you're, you're having the, the conversation with the, the property management company, there are so many times I'm like, do this. We have to do this instead of that, right? Like, come on. Right. It's right. Very, you know. So I, I get that. But knowing that, what are some of the common issues that you as an LP going into that very first deal saw that as a lead, you would change? Like, if, if it were mine, I would do this differently. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, even just as an LP, maybe not even if I was the lead, I would just say also from a sponsor standpoint, right? If, yep. if I bring an LP into a deal, the things that I would do differently and that we do do differently because of our experience. Um, the main one I noticed right off the bat was communication, right? We just did not get a whole lot of communication after we invested our money. And that bothered me. Like if you put money in the bank, you get a monthly statement from the bank showing you what that money's doing, right? Mm -hmm. If you any brokerage account, same thing. You get kind of a, an update, if you will, on what's happening with your money. And I was expecting at least that from you know the deals that we invested in as LPs. And we did have one sponsor that was really great about doing that and relaying every month to us. Here's you know the P and L. Here's what happened this month. Here's how many units we renovated and was very thorough in conveying all that. And then another deal we invested in is complete radio silence. We have no idea what's going on with the deal unless we initiate contact and try to find out. Yeah. So I definitely never want to do that to our investors. I want to be super transparent. We're committed to always providing at least that monthly update and, you know, having them having access to like their portal where they can see live, you know, real time what's happening with the yeah. investment. Yeah. So having been on multiple deals with different sponsors, like different not all the same, correct? Your investments right. and your, okay. So having done that, what portal or platform do you prefer and like the most that provides that information? Because I know there's like InvestNext, there's, you know, a sponsor or something. There's a number of them. Yeah. Uh, so the one, one I like the best is Cashflow Portal. Okay. 
Yeah, that one is phenomenal. And the functionality that it has, I have to say on the, our last raise, I was actually the one in charge of uh, tracking all the wires and the investments and doing all the communications with the LPs. And it's an impressive platform. I really encourage people to check it out. They're adding some sort of CRM function to it now. So I'm excited that you know they're adding more and more functionality to it but it's really phenomenal in what it can do. And the investors seem to love it too. They say it's easy to navigate. They can access all their documents, all their updates and everything are right there. Yeah, that's good. I, I saw them at uh, Old Capital did an event in Dallas a while back and I went to it and they were they had a booth there and I started talking to the guys. But how does it compare in pricing to say like Investnex or Apple or something like that? You know, they, I think their pricing is very competitive. And what I like about them is like, if you're not in a lead role yet, you can still have your account with them, um, have it linked with, you know, the lead sponsor mm -hmm. and you're not paying anything until yeah. you have the, you know, your own deal, so to speak. And then yeah. they base it on the size of the deal is what you're paying. So it varies, you know, on how much capital is being raised for the deal. The event. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very, yeah. It's very competitive. Yeah. All right. So good information. Very helpful. If you're going and again, you're looking to set a business like this up, there's a, a lot of tools and things that you can use. So we just name dropped a few of them in there. We'll put some links in the show notes. As far as deal flow that you're seeing now, 30 deals gets you one LOI, right? 30 underwrites gets you one LOI type of thing. In the last two years, how many have you guys done? How many raises have you done or how many deals have you have you been on? And what is what does that look like? I guess, <laughs> again, you're co-GPing a deal, you're raising capital into other people's deals. So it gives you an opportunity to look at deals that are already active, right? So it may right. be a little bit easier, faster. You can cherry pick some that you want to raise for or not raise for. Um, so how many have you guys actually gone into and, and done? Yeah. So uh, last year we did three deals and pretty successful on all of them. We raised 2 million, the first one, 2 million, the second one, the third one was a little bit smaller deals. And we only raised a million for that one. But, you know, that's kind of our, our goal is three a year, because when you look at how long these deals take, you know, it's typically going to be at least a 90 day process, right. Mm -hmm. With you, your due diligence, and then your 60 days to close and all that. So trying to do more than three or four a year is, is pretty difficult because, I don't know how other people do it, but when we're doing a capital raise, my husband is literally on the phone, probably 10 hours a day, talking to investors, calling investors, answering questions. You know, we're doing our webinar and then I'm so actively involved on the cash flow portal side of it with tracking all the investments. It's very time consuming. So to be able to dedicate our attention to more than one deal at a time for us doesn't make sense. Mm. And, and I don't think it's fair to the lead sponsors either. If you're raising capital for more than one deal, it, it also puts you in kind of a precarious position. If an investor finds out you're raising for two, they're going to like, which one's the better deal? Where yeah. would you put your money? You know? So I think just doing one at a time makes the best sense for us personally. And as far as the deal volume. Yeah. I mean, we are seeing a lot more volume now, but we are still seeing sellers have not like come around to the reality of pricing. Uh, most of the deals that I underwrite are still like 15 to 20% high. And I don't know when the sellers are going to wake up to it because it seems like even the sellers that are in trouble that have debt, you know, coming due, um, they're already bleeding money. They're still like holding out for higher offers and not getting them. So I don't know what it's going to take to wake some of them up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's still rescue capital chasing after some of these deals too with um, Pref Equity. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. I'm, I'm surprised they're going after some deals, Pref Equity, because they are in that position. But that and some lenders are still helping extend at least on uh, some of the deals that I've talked to in the mastermind that I'm in. Uh, right. They don't want them back. So, but yeah, I, I agree. I've made a bunch of offers on things and I'm at least 15% at a minimum below what everybody is asking or what the listed price is sometimes even more. Um, we've noticed that there's, there's a lot more lender monitored sales as well. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah. that that's coming down the pipe, but 
a friend of mine who owns a number of properties solo by himself here in San Antonio, we were talking the other day and, and I was like, what are you seeing? I mean, you have the capital to deploy. Are you ready to go buy? And he's like, nope, I'm still waiting. I'm going to wait until, you know, 2025 rates are going to stay higher for longer as we've all seen. So anyway, yeah. yeah, on your front of actually buying deals, are you looking at all those states as well? Or are you only targeting those states for the syndication business? Uh, well, yeah, just for the syndication business, for our personal investments, you know, we want to keep those close to home. So our portfolio of like mostly duplexes now, we're just looking right in our local area for those. Yeah. So I guess if you're looking to buy an apartment complex though, solo, are you going to buy it solo, I guess, or are you going to syndicate oh, that? Yeah, we would syndicate it, it unless it was small enough. Like we're looking at one right now in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I don't know if you're familiar with that market. No. Uh, this property is a mess. I mean, we bid on it way back. I want to say the first time we offered on it was maybe in September of last year. Missed it by like a hundred thousand. It went with another buyer. It came back on the market, put in another LOI. Then some group came in with 1031 money, said they were going to take it at, you know, a way higher price. Now that's fallen apart. Now it's back around again. <laughs> Vacancy has just, you know, it's what, 70%, I think, occupied now because yeah. they pulled their property managers off and the property is just, you know, now you have to get bridge debt before it was agency debt. Now it's mm -hmm. bridge debt. It looks a lot different. So we're probably about 2 million less than what we originally offered. Yeah. And it's, because it's... the purchase price has gone so low and it's bridge now, so we don't need a whole lot of equity. Now we're looking at it more as a JV, if we can get into that one, yeah. uh, we can get, you know, three or four partners. We can take that one down as a JV. It'll be a lot more profitable. But if it's larger than, you know, a couple million dollar equity raise, we'll, we definitely need to syndicate something so, like that. Yeah. And and for any of those, you're looking in those four states, not just yeah. in Florida. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Yeah. So the smaller deals, you're, you're close to home, syndicated deals anywhere. Got it. Right. Right. Yeah. So again, I guess the ones that you're on that you guys have bought recently as co-GPs, how are those things performing in the last couple of years? doing great really they were all so what we target is value add i guess i should have uh, kind of gone over our buy criteria um we look for about 100 to 200 units uh class b c plus you know in a in a b area and we do the value add model so we're looking for some meat on the bone so to speak we want to have some units left that need renovations and then, you know, we can increase the rents that way. We've been really lucky in finding properties that have been severely under market rent as well. So even just bringing them to market has helped tremendously. And then when you, you know, incorporate the value add into that and being able to push them even a little higher, um, it's been super profitable so far. Everything's been going really smoothly. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's good to hear because uh, a lot of people I know that bought in the last couple of years are having trouble, right? Yeah. Uh, so when you guys bought them, are you, I guess, is one lead or one operator performing better than others? And it's um, evident and you're like, okay, let's, let's pile as capital allocator. We're going to pile more money into these guys deals or this, this gals deals or whatever it is. Definitely. And that's where, you know, it's powerful to pick who you partner with and really vet them because a partnership is like a marriage. You know, you're going to be with these people for probably five, six years, depending on the length of your business plan. Uh, you really want to make sure that you're in alignment with those people. And we have found through, through this process that there's certain people, yeah, that's going to work for that deal, but we're not going to partner with them again, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so we have found some partners that we really click with that, you know, they underwrite like we do super conservative. I mean, we're putting in a, an entire year worth of reserves on most of these properties. So even if, you know, they're not occupied for a year, we'd still be okay. And that's kind of our worst nightmare is to lose someone's money. So we only are going to invest in super conservative deals. And we know that these people that we partner with feel the same way. So we're definitely going to continue to align with them. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. It's good to uh, that you guys had diversified in the sense that you have raised from multiple different types of people. And, and so you get to see that. So let's talk about this. I'm kind of curious. I'm always asking the types of deals. Are you, are they five, six B C? Can you talk about the return profile or, or what are they? 
Yeah. So we usually will start out as a 506B on most of these deals. And then if we need to, we'll transition to a 506C. But the last deal that we raised for our GP team as a whole, we raised $10 million in seven days. It was such an enticing property. Yeah. That, yeah, we did not even need to think about changing it over. We had one prior to that, that it was a much larger raise. We did end up having to transition that one to the, you know, 506C, but we prefer not to. I mean, it's just easier and, you know, it costs more money to build that into the paperwork, you know, all the attorney's fees and all that as well. But I can tell you some of the returns on some of the properties that we've closed on and how they're doing right now. We have one that's in Savannah and we weren't supposed to start paying out our distributions until about month nine is kind of what we had told investors to expect, but we've been able to stabilize it so much quicker and raise the rent so much faster than we thought we'd be able to, that we we're already paying out distributions on that one. Nice. And that, it was only like three months that it took us to get to the point where we could pay out distributions. So yeah. we were super proud of that. And like that one, we're projecting, we're doing an 8% preferred return and we're projecting about a 17 IRR and a 20 ARR and at least a two equity multiple. It'll probably end up being closer like two and a quarter. That property has just been doing gangbusters. So we, that's probably our best one, to be honest, that we've had so far. But the one that we raised 10 million in a week that one truly is what they call a unicorn. Like this was owned by a family. They had owned it since they bought it as 30 year old property. They were managing it themselves, 108 units. And um, they kind of focused more on just keeping people in there. And they didn't really care about the market rent as much. They weren't really keeping up with it. And if, if you can believe this, they were almost over a thousand dollars under market rent. So we're going in renovating everything because nothing's been renovated. And we know because we're raising the rent so drastically, we're going to you know, lose probably half of the people that are in there now. Those tenants aren't going to be able to afford paying double what they're paying. So we factored that into our underwriting. Uh, but that one truly is a unicorn. And then that one, I think it could be close to a two and a half equity multiple. You know, this- Conservatively, I think it's 2.3. And it's just killing it already. And uh, we just closed on that one in December. So we haven't even, you know, been operating it that long, but we've already proven our business model with doing some renovations and raising the rents and it's going very, very well. So on something like that, are you doing bridge and then refinancing? What's the, what's the strategy for you guys? That one, we got seller financing. Oh, wow. Yeah. They still want the cash flow. So, so were you buying on actuals? Or were you buying on Proforma? We were buying on actuals. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, the beauty of buying from like a mom and pop kind of thing. It's uh, a lot easier. Like the one we're working on right now, we're buying from, um, gosh, the word is escaping me. And in, in, what do they call those? Gosh, the big, huge conglomerates that own. Broker? Uh, no, Institution? No. Institution. Gosh, I was saying industry was coming (laughs) to mind. I don't know. Yes. We're buying it from an institution and it it's been taking forever. Like normally this team that we work with, they will negotiate and get under contract and due diligence. Everything will be done like so quick, quick, quick. Right. Mm -hmm. And this one it's taken almost three months just to get to PSA. And we're still going back and forth with red lines on the PSA. And it's been really frustrating how long it takes to negotiate with them, but they have so many different people that have to approve it. You know, how many units on the, on the institutional and how many units was it was a hundred units, give or take for the seller finance deal. Mom and pop. Yes. That one was yeah. 108. This one is um 203. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd take seller finance on a mom and pop all day. Yes. Yeah. That's incredible. So again, to the extent you can talk about it, when you guys are setting up your syndication and, and you're setting up your raise, how do you guys typically structure your deals? Again, I don't know if uh, if it's a 506C, oh, yeah. I'm guessing you can talk about it, like it's an 80-20 split with an 8 pref, whatever that looks like. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about that. We target, um, and the partners that we partner with do the same, which is nice. We do a 70-30 split, 8% pref okay. is kind of our 
you know, main criteria that we focus on. And yeah. then kind of the returns we were just talking about on that other one, our, our minimum underwriting standards are like a 15% IRR and a 2X equity multiple. We might go a little bit under that for the right deal, but 2X is really what most investors want to see. Yeah, that's uh, uh, very good. Let me see. So what uh, on the capital raising side, because that seems like you guys are rock stars at it. <laughs> it's doing yeah, very good. Mostly my husband. Yeah. Uh, you said 10 hours a day on the phone, right? And a lot of management of the, of the cash coming into the account. Who is he calling, right? What are the strategies that if somebody is listening to you talk and here's your success and what you guys are doing, how can someone else replicate that? Like, what exactly are you guys doing? Where is the list coming from? Who is he calling? And how do you go raise capital? Good. Right. Great question. Yeah. Well, when we first started, of course, you always hit up first your family and friends, right? Yeah. That's really all we had at that point. So we went in and started using Active Campaign. We were talking about that a little bit before. Active Campaign allows you to set up drip campaigns. So we first called, you know, everybody that we knew and kind of told them, this is what we're doing. If, you know, really no pressure, just kind of, Hey, if you're interested in following along on our journey, we'd like to sign you up for our emails. So you can kind of keep track of what we're doing. Um, we made sure to talk to each person one-on-one -on -one individually, not just throw them in a database and have emails start going out to them. We wanted to get their permission to put them in, give them a heads up that they were coming. And then we built a drip campaign of about 10 emails that were designed kind of to educate them about what a syndication is, because most of the people we were talking to had never heard of one. So we did that. We did a series of those where they send about every four or five days and we tell them to expect that. That way they don't think we're like spamming them. You know, yeah. we tell them that's going to be going on for about 10 emails and then it'll, you know, back off to maybe one or two emails a month. And we'll let you know, you know, when we have a, an investment opportunity that you might be interested in. And we're definitely not like a high pressure, high sales kind of thing. We feel like we're bringing you an opportunity. If you like it, you take it great. If it's not for you, that's fine too. We love it. We love the returns and we know it can make a big difference in your financial situation. But if you're not interested, no skin off our back, we're never going to push it on anybody. And that's kind of the way that we've, you know, approached this from the beginning. And then once we did our first deal, it's kind of the same thing as what happened with deals coming to us our investors started talking about it and how good the experience was and how quickly they started getting their distributions. And, you know, then they were like, can I tell my friend about this? You know, we're like, yes, please tell mm -hmm. everybody about it. <laughs> and our list just slowly started growing. Right. Um, so we only have about 300 people in our database. So we don't have thousands and thousands, like some of these people have that do this, but we try to make it, super personal. Like Marv goes through every week and he focuses on, okay, this, uh, this week I'm going to text everybody in my phone from a through C. Right. And he'll just go through and shoot everybody. To, hey, I'm out on my walk. I'm thinking of you. How are you doing? And just that personal relationship, right. we really work on building that. And he's super great at doing that. That's why he does that. And I don't because I'm on the <laughs> computer with the numbers. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'm really good at supporting him with sending out the emails and, you know, setting all of that automation stuff up for him because that's not his forte. So we kind of complement each other's skill set that way. Now, recently what he's done, because you can only get to so much with family and friends, right? So now what he's done is kind of started on social media, which has been a game changer. I mean, I can't believe how well it's working. I, I never would have thought that it would work, but he sets his intention. He's very intentional about it, very methodical about it. And he makes sure he posts at least three times a week and he does it on LinkedIn. Yeah. And he just talks about the business and he has a call to action. And, you know, he's very intentional about reaching out, connecting with people on LinkedIn. And he's getting a lot of reach outs from that. In fact, like last week, he had three new investors that he talked with just based off of LinkedIn posts. So that's really been like a game changer because we thought, oh gosh, you know, we've your family and friends, you can only 
ask them so many times for money and that's going to be tapped out. Right. But now we've found this new way to continue to add investors to our database and help more people learn about this. Yeah. That's awesome. Like very tactical ways that you can replicate what you guys are doing. And I don't know, but I would assume that you got some of this and some of the training from the mastermind that you were in and, and how, the how to's. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I just so recommend that to people. Cause there's things you, you just don't think about or you don't know. And, and having that network of people too, not only what they teach you at the mastermind, but also what you can learn from other members of the mastermind has been super powerful for us. Yeah. Are you guys in the middle of a raise for anything right now? We're starting next week. Okay. All right. Yeah. Is yeah. it, is it a public or is it you starting with the five and six B again? Yeah. We're going to start with the B again. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, if you want to get to know Victoria and sorry, what was your husband's name again? Marv. 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 Yeah. I'm going to put your contact info in the show notes um, and uh, reach out. I mean, they're doing some awesome work. They, as you heard, uh, have properties and all kinds of investments that they're working on in di different states. So Victoria, I appreciate you jumping on your information, just sharing the tactics. It's very helpful for anyone who's looking to do this sort of business. So yeah, I appreciate the yeah, information. I hope on. it will help people and really just take action. You know, if whether syndication is for you or not, you know, if you're an agent, you have to get started investing in real estate. Stop making all your customers rich while you're not. Invest your commissions. <laughs> <laughs> I just had another guy that I was talking to and he's a realtor in Ontario. And he was like, man, I was just crushing it for all these investors for so long. And then finally- <laughs> Like, I'm just going to buy one. So then you bought one. Yeah. It yeah. sounds simple enough. Just go do it. Right. It is. I think we get analysis paralysis and, you know, it's, it's the fear factor, but just do it. You know, the best time to invest in real estate was 20 years ago, but the second yeah. best time is right now. <laughs> so right. do it. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Victoria, it's great catching up with you. Have an awesome day. We'll catch you guys on the next episode. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional? If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.